to walk with me. We're gonna check out some really cool trees. We're gonna hang around and talk about all those things in nature that we can't live without. Let's go get nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature. Nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature, baby. Nerdy, yeah, let's get nerdy about nature. Come on, let's get nerdy about nature. Ah, oh, hello, hello, hello. Welcome, everybody, to the Nerdy About Nature podcast. My name is Ross. I'm your host here. Um, I'm currently sitting just off the side of a parking lot, and it's fairly busy. Um, you know, I made this foolish promise to myself that when I started this, I would record every piece of these podcast episodes outside to just truly embrace the outdoor nature of it all. And uh, it's led to some pretty funny interactions because as you can imagine, most of the times I'm just off of a trail or in this case off the side of the road and people will be walking by with their dogs and they'll just see this dude off in the woods just like with a camera set up, some ridiculous headphones on, talking to himself. It must look like a total psychopath. Um, but here I am doing it, making it happen. Super stoked to bring you today's conversation. I had a great opportunity to sit down with a good friend of mine, Diane Rudge. Um, I've actually known her for over seven years now and never really knew how to pronounce her last name until this conversation. I've always pronounced it Rouge, Diane Rouge. See, she's an artist. She's a, a textile artist. And I feel like when you're an artist, it really helps to have a kind of a, a really unique pen name that people remember you by something classy something fancy and diane rouge fit the bill you know i always just remembered her as that so um in addition to all of her amazing textile art that she does she's actually the co-founder of a refillery based on the coast of vancouver island called the den which is just a really cool, innovative business model. And I feel like it's a really important part of the many different parts to a truly sustainable future that we all should be working towards. You know, I always find conversations with her to be extremely inspiring because it's not like she has some sort of crazy background in retail or soap manufacturing or chemical stuff, but she's just kind of found this niche through trying to find ways to do better and offer better things for people and improve their lives on a daily basis. And I think that's kind of something that a lot of us need to embody these days is we don't necessarily need to be experts to learn how to do things differently. You know, so much of the world we live in today is dictated by these massive companies that tell us, oh, consumers have the choice and in a free market economy, we're going to change the world. But like, really, it comes down to like systemic change is what we need, especially in this era of climate change to really tackle a lot of these big issues. Um, and this whole refillery model shows a way of just kind of creating one step up from the consumer level, creating a new business opportunity where people can do good, can support good local things, and can create a better world um, one step at a time. And I think it's just a really cool thing. So I wanted to chat with her and share all that with you. Um, so yeah, here we go. What's up, Dee? Not a whole lot. Welcome to yeah. the, the podcast. Thanks for having me. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Who yeah. are you and what do you do? Um, I'm Diane and I am one of the founders of The Den um, here in Euclid on the, I guess, the ancestral lands of the New Channel people. Um, really thankful to be operating our business here and living here. Um, yeah, our business is a zero waste refill store that we started, my partner and I, Kristen O'Keefe. Um, we started, I guess it's just over two years now going into our third year. Has it only been two years? I know. I keep reflecting on the time and I'm always like, oh, just over a year. And I'm like, no, it's, or sometimes it feels like it's a baby still. And other times I'm like, we've been doing it for decades. Yeah. But, um, you've been doing enough work where it feels like yeah. you've been doing it for much longer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It was a fun spot to be in. No, it was October, 2019. So, um, was kind of when we first opened our doors and a refillery. So what is a refillery? A refillery is, um, yeah, it's a place where you can go and bring your own container. It doesn't really matter what it is. And you can basically start eliminating waste from your everyday household items. So we refill um, all your cleaners, all your shampoos, conditioners, bathroom amenities. Some refilleries have food, which is amazing. We don't have the capacity to do that yet. Um, maybe one day, but yeah, just a, a really nice, simple, low waste option for, yeah, things. So it's like the bulk bin item at like a grocery store, like save on, except for like household items. So exactly. And beyond that, what kind of stuff do you sell? 
Beyond that, we also have um, a little bit of a gift shop vibe going on. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we sell like local pottery. We sell um, skincare items. We sell, sometimes we'll do a plant pop-up. We like collaborating with different people for pop-ups. Right. Um, we, yeah, we don't, we don't really say no to much, I guess. Like, but the focus is always sustainability and local. And if we can't get something locally then we're focusing on sustainability and the story that that has yeah how did you get into the sustainability world like yeah that's a great question um i guess before we get into any of that okay um where are you from tell me about yourself growing up oh okay um i grew up on the east coast from toronto and uh, but i moved out west um Mm, the old story, that the bell, Ontarian moving west. Story. <laughs> Typical. <laughs> yeah, I moved out kind of right when I was like right after high school, 18, 19. Um, slowly made my way west, Calgary first for a few months and then kind of Whistler and kind of had my foot in the door between bouncing back and forth bef- between Ontario and BC for about three years and then made the full commitment to move out west um, when I was about 22. Yeah. Yeah. And you came out for snowboarding, right? Yes. Yeah. I used to snowboard competitively. I did that for five, six years, I guess. Yeah. Doing what kind of stuff? Uh, freestyle. I was on the freestyle team for slope style and I did half pipe. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. I can't imagine you snowboarding. I don't think I've ever seen you snowboard. You've Just, never seen me snowboard? It's not the you that I know, that I've <laughs> I known. I guess it's true. Yeah. Yeah. We met. We met in Squamish like that. five or six years ago. Yeah. But I don't think, yeah, you weren't competing or anything. Then. No. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tell me about your, sorry, I'm going to take my jacket off. It is I know, fucking the hot. Sun. It was supposed to rain today. And um, I think there's some rain clouds way out there. For those who aren't watching this podcast. Yeah. Oh my God, you're blowing it because this is a gorgeous little setting. We've got <laughs> an island out here. We're here at Terrace Beach in Ucluelet. Um, Just a lovely spring day in between rainstorms. Um, you know, lots of, lots of rockweed growing on the on the rocks here in a little intertidal zone. Pretty. Is that what that's called, rockweed? That's rockweed, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, really common brown algae around here in the Pacific Northwest. I think it's actually one of the most abundant brown algaes we I have. I see it everywhere. Like all the way down to California and up through Alaska. It's everywhere. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes I come and harvest some from my gardens. Oh, for fertilizer? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Um it's always my favorite too when the tides like kind of half and they're like just swaying. Yeah. That's the best. Yeah. <laughs> it's like meditation <laughs> for seaweed. So you've always um, been engaged in the outdoors though. Yes. Tell me about that growing up in Ontario, like getting into snowboarding. What was that like? And and then even coming out here to BC, how would you engage with the outdoors and what, what role did that play in your life? Well, growing up in Ontario, um, I guess like I was always athletic, but like my um, transition into being engaged in the outdoors through sports wasn't really until snowboarding. Um, and so that kind of really opened my eye to, you know, like obviously there's, you know, we see receding like glaciers and like snow and like different changing water, weather, weather patterns. Um, so that kind of like was a natural like transition and like brought awareness, um, throughout my career. And then hiking up mountains, being a part, being so like in tune with the mountains or being just like in them you can't help but like notice the beauty and like being around it versus like growing up in a city when you're just like in a concrete jungle like obviously there's talk of um well actually probably there wasn't when I was growing up um of like zero waste movements and like being like responsible that was not a thing at all so I really didn't start to see any of that um honestly even till like my later 20s um Because even post snowboarding, my first business, I had started a store in Squamish with um, a friend and that was kind of more in the fast fashion industry. And I think that's actually what kind of opened my eyes to like waste and being more sustainable. And at the time it was really fun and creative. And then I just started to become a lot more aware of like the consumption of it, the consumption of it all and like what I was selling and what I was pushing. And I was just like, Oh, this is not starting to align with who I'm growing into as a person. Right. Um, And so that's kind of when I had to take a step back from that and start to change what I was doing and focus on something else. And yeah. 
kind of slowly led more my I thought slowly led me into like a more sustainable life I would say yeah because I mean fashion is like it's, it's one of the worst fashion industries. really is one of the worst <laughs> yeah. um and especially when you're like in the business of selling things it's like so yeah. easy to just get wrapped up in like your overhead and your bottom line yeah. and trying to push product yeah yeah it's tough just selling like unnecessary <clears throat> things and yeah, I don't know. You just wouldn't leave work at the end of the day being like, wow, I made a difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. And then yeah. Um, outside of snowboarding and everything and moving on past that, then your transition out here to Vancouver Island. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what's that connection been like being so close to the ocean, something so different? Like, Yeah, it was interesting living in Squamish and then moving here. Like Squamish is obviously an um, oceaning town, but it doesn't have that ocean community feel, or at least it never yeah. did for me. Maybe not obvious to everybody listening. Yeah. Squamish is like a little town on the house right. sound north of Vancouver, about 45 minutes north of Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, gorgeous little town in the mountains on the yeah. water. Super rad. It is beautiful. Yeah. Super rad. Um, but yeah, and then as soon as, you know, we moved here, it was just such a different feel. Like we're walking literally beside the ocean almost every day. And so you're also walking in microplastics every day, unfortunately, and seeing that it was a lot more present, I think, than it was anywhere else. Cause when you're like hiking up a mountain in contrast in Squamish, I would be doing that a lot more than walking along the beach. You're not seeing as much. And so that really opened up my eyes at least, um, to some of the issues going on because like the ocean's kind of like the bottom of the bend in a way like everything trickles down through yeah. different watersheds yeah its whether there. whether it's coming it's like a land-based plastic or an ocean-based plastic and doesn't really matter how it gets there it almost always finds its way into a water stream and then so before you got in be i guess while you were doing that that fashion quote-unquote business <laughs> you're an artist i am an artist as well yeah tell me a little bit about your <laughs> art um, I the work with rouges. the Rouges, yes. Rouge. That's what everyone likes to call me. It's not how you say my name for the record. <laughs> <laughs> how do you say your last name? It's just Raj. Raj. <laughs> it's like super like, no, not bland, but, or it's just like choppy. It's like fudge, but with yes. an R. <laughs> yeah. 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 Versus when it's a fancy high priced <laughs> yeah. item, an art piece, it's a rouge. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. Um, no, I work with fiber art and I just kind of slowly got into that. Um, I don't know. It just kind of happened organically. I was always drawn to texture, I think in art. I took art all through high school and then kind of have always been like creative for sure. And my grandmother's an artist. And then I don't know, I just naturally found my medium, we'll say working with fiber and, I slowly taught myself how to weave and just kind of became so enthralled with it and so passionate about it and kept learning. And so I was doing that. Um, I guess I, I started that almost 10 years ago, maybe not quite, but then worked full time as an artist for about four years before I started the den. And I've taken a bit of a step back, but I'm still really into it and still creating. But yeah, a lot of weaving, knitting, natural dyeing, um, slowly learning, basket weaving as well. Um, mostly just focusing on, yeah, anything with natural fibers and the natural like dyes. And, right. Yeah. <clears throat> That's kind of like the center core of it all is like coming it back is. to like natural fibers, natural dyes. How, how, how do you, how have you been learning the stuff? Like where do you, cause I was over at your place one time when you were dying, you were using natural dyes on like old rags and old clothing pieces <laughs> And like you had like a, there was, was there a turmeric dye? Yeah, turmeric's a great dye. There's so many things in your kitchen that you can use and like food scraps, which is really I think cool. you had a beet one too, a purple um, one? Yeah, onion skins. I've always got tons of bags of those hiding right. around the house. <laughs> onion skins. <laughs> Yeah. Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> uh, just how did you get into that? How did you, um, like, oh. where do you learn about how to dye stuff? Like, um, did you take classes? Yes. There is an amazing, amazing school and store in Vancouver, which um, I'm just so lucky to have been able to go to. It's called Maiwa. They're an amazing resource and um, family owned business. And they have, uh, they have a school there. So every year I try and take a workshop. Um, it's been a little different with COVID, but they've switched everything online, which is really nice. Um, so yeah, I just kind of try and treat myself to that once a year and learn something new. And yeah, it's like a self-care learning thing. Yeah. They've been a really good source for mentorship and resource for learning. Mm -hmm. So then when you decided to kind of get going on the den <clears throat> or turn that into a refillery, 
Um, where, I guess, did you see the need or what kind of spawned the idea? Um, that's a good question. I mean, when we first moved to Vancouver Island, so my partner and I, we bought a commercial space and we didn't really know what we wanted to do with it at first. And then the first two years, so that was about five years ago, the first two years that we actually set it up as my art studio. And so I worked out of there and I had like a small collective, like other artists could come and rent desk space. And then I was feeling burnt out from that. I really didn't want to be working in town anymore and having like interruptions and yada, yada. So... I was moving my studio back home and then Kristen and I were deciding like, should we keep the space? Should we sell it? What are we going to do with it? And it was kind of right at the time, I think, when refilleries, to be honest, were like popping up throughout, you know, major city centers. There was definitely a couple in Vancouver I was following and I was like, Kristen, I think, you know, we'd both been like chatting about this idea and we're like, I think we should do this. Like we've got this great opportunity. We own the space. Let's give it a try. Mm -hmm. And so within like a couple months, we had just kind of like completely renovated and like reinvented the space. It was always called the den. Um right. You just rebranded we just and changed re-branded the mission it. behind it. Exactly. And so that was yeah, October 2019. Um and we were like, let's just go for it and see what happens. And working <laughs> so shifted from making natural art or art from mm-hmm. natural pieces to kind of selling and curating natural things yes yeah so the refillery i guess the business you could kind of say it's like two sections there's like the refillery side of it um which is yeah all everything in there is ocean friendly it's biodegradable we always make sure it's all safe ingredients there's no synthetic toxins and so that would be all your household cleaners like all-purpose laundry hand soap um dish soap and then you have like any sort of amenity you would need in your bathroom like shampoo conditioner body wash body lotion toothpaste um body oil dry shampoo i don't know what else? Look, there's tons of things. There's yeah. There's so many things. Well, then you've also got like the <laughs> like handmade curated mugs and yeah, and yeah. Kind of so, more artisan type exactly. Stuff. So there's the refillery side that has all that, and then the other the gift shop side. We kind of try and fuse the two together to create like a bit of a conversation for anyone that walks in. So everything in the gift shop um, is yeah handmade pottery or glassware or you know you can buy your like a sustainable toothbrush you can get like really nice skincare that's all made locally or in like a nice glass bottle it could be refillable as well you can find like nice tea towels um sometimes i'll have a hand at toque or something there <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you're still peddling your own yeah your own... i got a couple side hustles <laughs> in my funny. own business <laughs> That's just like an avenue for you to like continue to yeah. push out the totally the natural knit goods. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I guess. Do you know much about? Oh, it's getting chilly. What's in the average person's kind of household? Because I mean, natural soaps is not something that I ever grew up having with. Like, let's just say, like, I still remember having like my mom having pine saw out and like just these like horribly, horribly over fragmented laundry detergents where you would like yeah. you would wash your clothes and you'd be smelling it for a week like anytime oh you like God. picked up that shirt and it was just like nauseating but that's so normalized in yeah. so many parts of our culture these days like mm-hmm. well, why go natural what are the benefits the, there's in a there's so many amazing like health benefits like actually it's like scary how toxic some of these like cleaners and like products we grew up on um especially for women like women do the you know the dominant um or they're predominantly like buying your household goods, your household cleaners. They're using them a lot more than men, I would say. Mm-hmm. That's what we found, at least like most of our customers that are coming to refill and like any like, you know, customers of ours that are like housekeepers or house cleaners. It's like definitely a, a woman um more of like a woman dominant industry and so they're the other ones like making the decisions they're the ones making the decisions using the products um but yeah there's there's so many toxic chemicals in there and there's so many things that um companies hide behind being like oh i can't disclose what that is it's like a trade secret and so you don't actually even know what some of these chemicals are or these synthetic fragrances that they're using and over time they can just like build up within your bloodstream they can build up on your body they there's like you know so much like research now showing like issues with fertility in women just from like constantly being around these things so switching over to 
natural products, like honestly, it's just makes so much more sense. You just feel so much better using them right. over time. You don't have that like headache. I find headaches is like a big one for, mm-hmm. for people that like, and a lot of sinus issues as well. Sinus like, issues, skin issues, like rashes allergens. and yeah. But then like you go to a, a normal grocery store and there's mm-hmm. just like, nowadays there are more options. There's a lot like. more options like now. What's the brand seventh generation mm-hmm. or something. There's like all sorts of these like store brought ones that are like, you know, kind of greenwashed to be like clean and free and unscented. Yeah. That's like a new trending thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, growing up like that was, there was never any options. Never any options. And um... so you go to the store trying to buy for your family and all your options are like, tied with bleach or tied with not bleach yeah and like yeah. a massive gallon jug that once you're done with it it's like really thick durable plastic because obviously you don't want it, it spilling around your house but once you're done with it yeah it just disappears yeah you just throw it away i know have you ever like i feel like recently obviously or like not recently but like we I, for a while now i've obviously only been using like natural products so then like yeah once you start using natural products, like, and then you walk past someone or like you even like accidentally do a load of laundry in something else, it's like the shock of being like, how did I ever live like this? Yeah. Or like, how did I like have this touching my body or like smell like this? It's mm, The crazy. worst are, like, <laughs> are bed sheets. If you go to like stay at like your friend's house, your parents' oh house God. or something, and like you get in the bed sheets and it just smells like. Yeah. Recently. <laughs> fake um, lavender. <laughs> my mom would hate me for saying this, but I was visiting my mom and she <laughs> still uses Tide and I accidentally washed. I wasn't even aware of, um, wasn't even aware of like what I was like doing. Just like put in a load of laundry and washed my, like my face mask in like, just like the, I don't know, whatever scent of Tide she had. Yeah. And honestly, I just like, couldn't, you could not put that on. I was like, we need to soak this in water. We need, I'm going out <laughs> and getting some like new laundry soap. Yeah. And just, oh gosh, it was awful. Did it take the scent out? Were you able to rewash it? Honestly, I Because I almost feel like it kind of like it. stains it in, in a way. Yeah, it was, it was terrible. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny how I think um transitioning like out of post war North America, World War Two, like the fifties, the mm-hmm. boomer generation, like everybody just got, got caught so easily yeah. into that like um the kind of gimmick of like ease and comfort mm-hmm. in life and this is what you do. This is how you like have like a nice clean home and then this lemon scent is indica- indicative of a clean countertop. Totally. And this lavender scent is indicative of clean sheets mm-hmm. and you just like and then people have gone like overkill with that. Then it's like, how do yeah. we get this whiter? How do we yeah. get this crystal glass cleaner, clearer? Yeah. Um, and it's just kind of like snowballed almost out of control. And yeah, I mean, you have to list ingredients on food. Mm-hmm. But if it's something that you're using that, you know, that you are eating your food off of or like wearing around on a daily basis, like why do we not have to have ingredients in any of that? Well, there is ingredients for sure. People just don't really understand what these like 15, 16, like, you know, lettered words are yeah Yeah. so I'm like I I read that but I don't know what that means right Mm -hmm. and I think um and I'm not like an expert by any means in like chemicals and like production of these these products but um like there wasn't research back then being like oh this is bad for that reason like things you know post-war era or whatever like people weren't actively researching like the effects of these chemicals on humans Mm -hmm. like using them all the time they were just they saw that as progress i think and so now we're like relearning and like retraining ourselves being like oh we can actually go back and do it how we've always done for hundreds of years right before like they've been making soap the natural soap since i don't know we'll say like thousands of years ago yeah soap's been around for a long time it's only recently that we started adding all these unnecessary fragrances and other things to try and change it and like push i think i think it goes back to pushing consumerism into being like oh you can get this bar of soap but like have you tried this scent let's produce a new scent let's produce something new versus just sticking with what's always worked right um 20 percent more yeah same price exactly yeah i mean at the base level like soaps are basically all the same thing it's like an Mm. oil or a fat that like yeah traditionally it's made yeah with um fats and oils like yeah olive oil is a great soap um i'm trying to think about how it works (laughs) i don't know if i know enough about it to (laughs) to summarize it i know that like um there's something with like the ions on dirt particles and okay. the f- it's like drawn to the fat. Well, yeah, a lot of like, for example, stain remover bars that like we have are oil based. So like if you had like 
a stain on your shirt and like our one stain remover stick that we sell it's like a coconut oil base and so if you rub that on the clothing the oil like pulls it's like i think it's similar in concept like have you heard of like oil pulling <laughs> for like you're like swish oil around in your mouth and it like pulls toxins out no and there's like i have not heard of that <laughs> really no. it's supposed to be really good for like teeth whitening you can use like coconut oil i'm like so backwards oh, on okay. that. Like, <laughs> i i back it i support it i think it's mm. a great thing like yes we should be using more natural products yep. and like in every aspect of our life but like for me like i mean i have the detergent okay. i have soap yeah there's soap mm -hmm. but like i don't use any products That's fair. Like, <laughs> so and then with this like what's your primary market been then you said like house cleaners people at their own household stuff coming in refilling mm -hmm. the stuff that's kind of how it started yeah that's how it started was just kind of foot traffic um in the community like local residents coming to refill their their products for their kitchen for their bathrooms and then very quickly um being in such like a high popular or um high high tourist spot you know there's so many airbnbs here and so we quickly kind of pivoted and opened up and started like a refill program for B and B's and accommodations, kind of selling um, in more bulk to those yeah. businesses that would be going through more product. Exactly, yeah. So yeah, we cater to kind of to both now. We have, um, yeah, just walk in where you can weigh anything, bring in any bottle you want, and then we sell different set, like set volume amounts um, for to hotels and B and B's. Right. And that's like a really cool new unique market, I think, because it's mm -hmm. it's easy to just look at like the individual personal use, personal households, like yeah. what's a family of four mm -hmm. using on their day to day basis. Yeah. But I mean, when you think about any kind of travel or going to stay in an Airbnb or mm -hmm. a hotel, like, oh my God, the amount of single use plastics there, like little tiny shampoo things and a little tiny bar of soap you've got to like mm -hmm. peel out of the plastic to use mm -hmm. once maybe. I mean, personally, I will wash my hands with it and then like never touch it. Yeah. I think I read a stat that almost, I think just in the Pacific Rim alone, there's almost like 700,000 like single use plastic items every single year in our area. In the Pacific, what's the Pacific Rim? You mean like you clue it to Tofino? Mm -hmm. Just in this one little mm -hmm. stretch that's like what 40 k is mm -hmm. almost like 80 percent of landfill waste comes from like the commercial sector and like and the majority of that is in hospitality wow yeah and that's all you're just like your basic amenities mm -hmm. shower sh mm -hmm. or, yeah shower think goods, about shampoo, like soap those like 100 mil not even 100 mil they're like 10 mil 30 mil shampoo bottles that you're just so used to seeing when you travel it's like half the time if they're opened if they're not even open they kind of just get tossed in the garbage they don't get reused right um, it's not like they're refilling them they're not refilling them not only are they wasting the plastic they're wasting the product that was in there so then the which is often like a chemically derived like exactly. highly scented Thing. Yeah. And then like the carbon footprint of making that to put it in there. It's just like there's so many layers to it. Right. There's so much waste involved. But if you hang up your towel, they won't wash it because they're green. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Don't worry. Well, thank yeah. God you didn't wash my towel. Yeah. I mean, but even that, like even doing the laundry for places like that, when you have people mm -hmm. staying, um, you know, one night, two nights. And then, I, I mean, even if you stay multiple nights, like daily, they'll change your seat, their yeah. sh your sheets, they'll turn yeah. them for you. And it's like, that's a ton of laundry to a be lot, going a through. A lot of water. A lot of water use, yeah. a lot of detergents, a lot of bleach because mm -hmm. it's all white because it's just yep. easy to clean with bleach. Yeah. And so have you had good reception, like kind of moving into that Airbnb and hotel space? Like, Yeah. I mean, we're definitely fortunate and feel we feel really grateful being in such like a already like environmentally conscious community. Um, mm hmm. So people here are already like I think leaders in like sustainable sustainable tourism, but yeah, we're we've been very fortunate. Like we're supplying um, a number of really large accommodations and probably the first um, fully circular systems. I don't want to say in all of Canada, but it honestly, feels like what we're doing really is kind of pioneering in this industry yeah um and you've had the i guess like the privilege of being able to work with these people mm -hmm. directly like because yeah. you can know the manager from in town yeah and you can like yeah it's it's great it's like it's so much more than like a business transaction it really is like a partnership that we're building with all these accommodations and we really try and work we kind of how it starts is you know we'll connect with someone and we'll see their system see you know where it's not working how they want to change it and how we can support them and like create circular systems that are unique to every single accommodation it's not like it's not going to be uh 
one size fits all for everyone. And so it's like everyone kind of has to like get creative, learn how their systems are going to work compared to how someone else's might because everyone wants like that unique individual experience. They don't just want to be like, oh, yeah, we all have the same product. We all have the same like items necessarily. We're all doing the same thing. Like, sure, there is like a backbone and a structure that works that we use with every accommodation, but we really try and make it like specialized and individual so that, you know, they can feel supported and have whatever unique way that they need that. Right. And so in like a hotel setting, for example, you would have, you just, you're basically replacing the stuff that they already have, but Mm -hmm. instead of having like what I imagine in like some dark back room (laughs) as just boxes of like single use little shampoo bottles that just get replaced every time you now have like a big jug Yep. and they, and housekeeping would go in there and just fill up the little ones. Yeah. So the supply chain is so interesting. So we purchase in um, like 210 liter um, like rain barrels, essentially, you'll say. Um, everyone can kind of p- picture that, those big blue barrels. So we buy product that size um, and then we fill 20 liter containers. We get those 20 liter containers dropped off at the hotels and then they have their own systems of either filling like one liter bottles or like smaller bottles. It depends what they're kind of using um, and then they'll go around and the, so they'll put those in their like cleaning caddies and then they'll refill their dispensers or they'll refill their bottles from the 20 liters. When those 20 liter containers are done, we take them back, we wash, sanitize, and then keep them in use. So there's, we're cutting out almost all waste in the entire supply chain um, and making sure that everything gets used. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And then, so do they, are they in charge of finding like their own little like custom branded little things that go into the hotel rooms? Um, no, we, well, we help them with that. If they want, they're, they're definitely able to, um, but we, we offer support and on. Do you do custom area. scents and stuff? Custom. We don't do, we don't do custom scents yet. Um, well, I guess that's not true. We can for like certain things. Like we work with a really great company out of Squamish that makes us, um, custom like little amenity soap bars um, and so those we can customize our shampoo and conditioner we work with a brand called Oneka um, they have their specific scents and so we work with the ones that they offer and they're they're just so amazing anyways um, but yeah I mean it's not off the table we're always open to exploring new things right yeah <laughs> it's such a cool concept though because I mean it is one of those yeah. things that um, just becomes so commonplace like you don't mm-hmm. think about it like and if you think about it at least in my experiences when I've thought about it, like traveling or going to an airport and it's just like, it's, you know, it's bad. It's horrible, but it's, you just seem like this little tiny cog in this machine that you can't actually like do anything to mm-hmm. get this hotel chain to like change the way that they operate with single use plastics. Mm-hmm. Um, but I mean, seeing this happen mm-hmm. is inspiring. Thanks. Well, I mean, it's, it's cool because it's like you're changing the business model and doing it on like a small scale, a mm-hmm. local scale, but that's the way that all the best yeah. things happen and start. Yeah. Um, what are your kind of plans with this moving forward? Like, well, so currently we're working on setting up, um, a certificate program. We're really passionate about creating more transparency within, I guess, any area of sustainability, but specifically in like hospitality, you know, like you said earlier, like you can, you know, request for someone to not wash your towels and then the hotel can be considered like, you know, a sustainable stay. But like, I don't know, that feels like bullshit. Oh yeah. (laughs) All those little placards they post up. Yeah. We care about our water consumption. Exactly. If you want to reuse this towel, hang it up. Like you should be probably doing anyway instead of just kicking it on the ground. Yeah. Be an adult about it, hang it up. But it's like, that's not something that you should be patting yourself on the back for. It's like, that's the low hanging fruit. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to set up like a more like structured and transparent, um, certificate program. Right now we have it, it's called the sustainable and circular accommodation program or SCAP for short. Um, and in that program, there's three different tiers. You have your bronze, silver, and gold. And those, the bronze is kind of your entry level, you know, um, entry-level position. You're going to start with all your basic refillable items. Silver is going to be the next step up. And then gold is like the ultimate partnership. And they're like 100% circular in every single aspect um, and every area opportunity that they can. And so our goal with that is like, you know, start to have that become more recognized, not just in like hotels or Airbnbs, but also for like tourists and like travelers, you know, hopefully they're going to be the ones that are going to be pushing this and driving this and demanding this change because ultimately they have the power to do that. Right. Have you, um, in rolling this program out, have you been working with any 
airbnbs or businesses where you've heard like good reviews coming from this like, yeah how's absolutely the reception, been? the reception's been really great and like the one area that i love is like having the storefront in the town that we're supplying all these amazing products to is like you know we have some marketing material in all of the airbnbs we work with and in the hotels that we work with and so they'll then f- make their way and find their their way to our store and say hey i was like staying in this airbnb or i was at black rock or whatever. And um, like, we love the products. And then that just becomes another point that we can like educate and have a conversation. And then they can take something home with them being like, I love this shampoo. Where can I find it? And then, you know, we have a nice list of local refilleries and we're always of like in different areas throughout the country being like, they probably have something there now too. So like you can go home and like continue refilling this bottle that you've just purchased from us. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause you guys aren't the only refillery, but no. it's one of many things. Yeah. Like, That's the thing with refilleries is that like inherently they don't work on the kind of mass consumer scale that like we're taught to believe is like the way that companies should become. Like you're not, um, you know, you're not a successful company unless you've like, you're gone nationwide and Mm -hmm. you're on the stock market. Yeah. We're not trying to become a Walmart over here. (laughs) Right. But like that model wouldn't even work because it like a lot of your products come from local here on mm-hmm. Vancouver Island and like to all these different refilleries that are operating, like they're all supporting local wherever they are. Mm-hmm. That's great. Mm-hmm. It is wonderful. The refill like community, I'll say like recently I've been having a lot of conversations with other refilleries um, and business owners across the country. And it's just been, it's honestly been so lovely because it's been such collaborative conversations. And I feel like there really is such a need and such a want for like this like community that where we can like lean on each other, support each other. You know, it's like, we're doing this out here in BC, but it's like, how are you doing it in Ontario? Let's like, you know, what can I learn from you? How can I teach you something? And so it's been really nice um, connecting with different refilleries across the country recently. Yeah. Cause mm-hmm. like the overall goal is so much bigger than every one individual Absolutely. person. Yeah. Have you had many experiences with um, hotel brands or people like just trying to kind of greenwash, like use you use? Um, not no, not specifically. Um, we're pretty strict on like marketing material and like what is and isn't acceptable. I'd say like not necessarily strict, but you know when we set hotels up, we. We, we do on-site training and we provide like, you know, marketing material if they, if they need it. And we're kind of like trying, I think we just, we try and educate as best we can to avoid that. Um, right. So there's so much that goes into like our initial consulting and like setup that, I don't know, we just almost don't allow for a greenwashing opportunity. Well, have you had any incidents where because it's like so much of it is like also retraining not only these businesses mm-hmm. that have been just operating in this mode for however long um but it's training the consumers to like be looking out for different things yeah. or to recognize that um just because your hand soap doesn't have some um like excessively bubbly foamy or right. some rich fragrance doesn't mean that it's not quality yeah, I would say the education on a consumer um, point of view is was is definitely one of the hardest hurdles. It's like that exactly. It's like people have this association with like bubbles and foam equals cleanliness, and that's just not the case. Um, so training your customers and just like educating them on like the importance of what what you're selling and like why you're selling it um and why you know it might cost five dollars more than like a bottle of dawn dish soap but this is why it's such a better product and why this is the true cost and the true value of something and what it actually should be priced at Mm -hmm. um so you feel like a lot of that has been derived from just like frivolous kind of marketing mm -hmm. marketing and branding agencies like you know, doing their quadrants and finding out what consumers like and what, oh, people are really attracted to like suds and bubbles. So you have like, you add like another additive that creates that sudsy bubbly effect, even though it has no effect on how mm-hmm. the product actually performs. Mm-hmm. It's become so much less about that and more about the visuals or like interface with, with it, like the way mm-hmm. that people interact with it and like use yeah. the product. Well, Sorry, what was the question there? No, I was just making oh. a statement. <laughs> okay. I just think it's crazy that we've gone yeah. so far from um, just being something being good enough and being yeah. useful and working well to mm-hmm. now it has to work well, plus have all this this laundry list of yeah. like bonus frivolous yeah. features that don't actually contribute anything beyond just like some quote unquote peace of mind that's been sold to you through a mm-hmm. marketing campaign. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
It's true. I mean, one of the fun things I think about my job and like on that point of being like just like marketing and selling is, you know, we're we're obviously it's like an uphill battle, but we're trying to make refilling fun and like convenient and like also aesthetically pleasing. Like we get it. Like people want things to look nice in their home. And so like if they're going to be attracted to this like nice bottle that like maybe is full of synthetic toxins or whatever, it's like, okay, how can we compete with that? Well, we can also offer like equally nice packaging that is sustainable. We can put on beautiful labels. We can, you know, there's so many other options um, and like creative workarounds that I think so people I feel like sustainability has kind of been like branded like, you know, granola, we'll say. So it's like trying to work away from that and being like, no, sustainability actually can be really lovely and beautiful. And so let's try and like build on that. And you know what? At the end of the day, if like that's the only reason someone's switching over is because they like our branding, then like whatever, I'm still going to call that a win. Totally. So, yeah, yeah. it's serving the bigger picture. Exactly. But yeah, it's funny how um, pigeonholed kind of like sustainable, quote unquote, things have been Mm -hmm. for so long. It's like, oh, if it's not in a brown burlap bag, how do you know it's recycled? Totally. It's like, well, you can do it better. You can still make a pretty product that's like appealing and do it in a good way. It's just there hasn't been the market drive to force a lot of companies to do this until recently. Yeah. And it's awesome to see what you guys are doing. Yeah, we're excited about it. Have you ever had any experiences where people did not like the product and like preferred that like? For sure. For sure. And we're, we love to hear that feedback because it can only help us do our jobs better and like source better products. Um, I think the toughest one is dish soap f- for people. Interesting. Pe- yeah, that's for some reason it's, yeah, it's the number one product that we're like oh I loved everything I didn't love the dish soap it didn't seem to cut the grease well enough or it didn't um and there's no specific dish soap I'd say it's just like to each their own some people like this one dish soap some people like another one some people like the solid bar as a dish soap but I think again that's just like retraining like what bubbles equal (laughs) exactly (laughs) right um you have a funny experience with toilet paper too don't you I do (laughs) would you like to share that I don't know if it's a funny experience well (laughs) I I mean funny like yeah I mean we sell toilet paper and like we just always joke that like when you know we were in our 30s we never envisioned we'd be selling toilet paper and like how excited we'd be about it but like like we're so jazzed up about it. But like with a, yeah. you had one client that was mm-hmm. like buying a lot of toilet paper yeah. and it was good. It was recycled. Because yeah. like a lot of the toilet paper that you see in hotels and stuff, it's that that same kind of white fluffy yeah. toilet paper that a lot of people don't know still depends on pulp made from old growth mm-hmm. forests. Mm-hmm. Um, the product we bring in, it's, um, it's called Cascade. It's manufactured in Quebec and it's 100% the line that we bring in from them is 100% made from post-consumer materials. So there's a white edition, we'll say, and that's made from recycled office paper. And then they have a mocha a, like tan colored one and that's made from recycled cardboard and it's really cool because we like have followed the supply chain and the cardboard in our community and you clue it here actually gets sent back to um, Quebec to get made into toilet paper and then sent back to us I mean so it's really interesting you can kind of like follow that around but um, yeah like you know one of our suppliers or hotels a couple of people have just like there's been feedback being like well we want it to be softer we want it to be like fluffier or more plush or whatever and you know we've lost a little bit of business there but we're gonna still keep selling it and keep trying to educate people on why it's right so important to be buying this toilet paper and you know not the white stuff (laughs) totally because i'm sure if if that person who wrote that complaint to that hotel had known that like that white fluffy toilet paper that they want only Mm -hmm. comes from a certain grade of pulp created from old growth they probably wouldn't want that anymore they'd probably change the way that they think but exactly it's re-educating yeah Education is so important in this industry. Well, in every industry. In the world, really. (laughs) I guess, where do you see the future of this industry going in refills? Like, what kind of world do you hope to create from all this stuff that you're doing? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, hopefully continuing to focus on, like, circularity and not just, like, bulk refilling and seeing that grow into, like, so many different industries. Hospitality being, like, a huge contributor to that. Um, but like every small business should be focusing on like circular, circular things that they can be doing to change, change like little systems in, in their business. So yeah, I'd love to just see it become the norm, you know, every, everyone should hopefully be able to access 
you know, sustainable options. And like, if they can't, hopefully there can be some like, you know, programs or incentives because I realize like, you know, refilling is definitely like something that does cost a little bit more. So hopefully if we can make it like more affordable to like any, any community or any household, um, would be really great as well. Well, and the convenience factor too, like it's, it's really easy for somebody to just like be done with something, kick Mm -hmm. it in the trash. And then the Mm -hmm. next time they're out, running errands just like pick up a yeah. new one setting versus... up con- convenient systems like offering delivery and like you know ordering online and like figuring out ways to do Which you guys to do, do that yeah local delivery we do in, in both in tofino and yuki we um we offer local delivery and so we just have bottle deposit jars so you can order online it'll come in a set jar there's like a small fee you, you bring the jar back you get your money back kind of vibe um, but there's, I've seen refilleries kind of all throughout major cities doing that as well. And it seems to be a really great model, especially for like convenience. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's a cool thing to see happening. And, uh, I think for me, it's just like the reason I wanted to bring you on and, and have you chat about this and mm-hmm. share this concept with people is because it is so much more than just like, it's more than just like buying products to clean mm-hmm. your house. It is like utilizing that local economy and working in small scales mm-hmm. and bringing it full circle in like a real tangible level where it's like, you can see the impact you're having. Yeah. And I think that's like incredibly important these days because in like this era of climate change with everything being so big and daunting and wildly out of control it's really easy for people myself included to feel pretty insignificant like you can't actually make a change right um but like this is just one small industry Mm -hmm. that you're kind of like you're you've kind of gotten into out of like passion for you know sustainable just use of of things and like basically every industry that exists today needs to have this kind type of revolution Mm -hmm. i think it's really inspiring to see um you guys doing this type of stuff and, and moving forward with that. And I think that more people need to kind of find their niche and like recognize whatever their expertise is that mm-hmm. like there's a role to play in doing things better and we can all do things better when yeah. we work together. Everyone has a responsibility. And I think that's what's so great about people that are already in the refill industry, whether that's like a business that's like, you know, like us, like that is an actual refillery or whether that's like one of our brands, you know, like I'll use the brand Oneka we work with um, quite a bit, but, you know, they offset at all of their plastic with the Plastic Bank of Canada, I think. So it's like they're they're taking the ownership on themselves, being like, we understand, you know, we are, there's some plastic consumption in our business model, but we're going to make sure that it's disposed of properly or we're going to take care of that properly. We're not leaving that up to the consumer. Um, and so it's like as soon as there needs to be more pressure applied, I think to these larger corporations that like if you're going to create waste then you have to like you know also deal with it on the other end right Mm -hmm. yeah and it's about like bringing it full circle so it's like because it's super easy and so many brands do this now it's just like ditch the end result on the consumer exactly. it's just like oh consumer choice you can recycle if you want yeah. to instead of like you don't embracing. have to buy it and right. it's like well you're setting us up for failure in a way totally it's like, versus like embracing that business mm-hmm. model and, and integrating it and making it part of the actual like product life cycle yeah and like creating it more a more circular cycle instead of just this like traditional one we've had from like cradle to grave totally and that's like it makes me so proud for like the hotels that we're working with like right. black rock and long beach and you know they're choosing that they're they're not just you know they didn't need to set up these circular systems and they didn't have to come to us to like for refill options but they chose that and now it's like they can share that with and educate their their guests with that Mm-hmm. And then hopefully, ideally, anybody that comes and stays at those places then goes yeah. on to wherever else they go from wherever in the world they're from. Exactly. And they start to demand more of that. Totally. Elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing the little like slow, slow growing ripple um, is really, really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> little mini tsunami coming. <laughs> yeah. A good tsunami. <laughs> good tsunami. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe like look yeah. over my shoulder. <laughs> so tsunami coming, right? Oh my okay. So in, in closing, um, if you had any kind of like words of advice or inspiration to just like the general consumer and like mm-hmm. their habits and like what it is that they're filling their household with their <laughs> grocery bag list, like anything, like what would you say? Like, um, well, I would say like probably the best time to start <laughs> refilling was yesterday, <laughs> Right. but you know, don't get overwhelmed with like, it's so easy to become overwhelmed with like making change. And it's like, just focus on one thing and like slowly make that a habit in your like day-to-day routine. So, you know, if you can only transition refilling dish soap, great, just do that and do it every single month, you know? And then when you're ready to move on to something else, like we don't all need to be like jump into everything like right off the bat and just like slowly make a change and just kind of see how it goes. Right. It's Mm -hmm. like 
with any of these big issues we face today, it's not going to come from a billion people all of a sudden changing and doing things perfectly. Yeah. It's going to come from... I mean, that would be great. Sure. But like, <laughs> yeah. realistically, it's going to yeah. come from everybody doing things imperfectly, mm-hmm. but like try, like striving to do better. Exactly. And like consciously doing it. And like, yes, that's going to come from mm-hmm. the systems we live in. Sure. But like, it can also start at the consumer level and like work its yeah. way up. And ideally with people like yourself kind of creating innovative Mm -hmm. new business models that is allowing people options to do things differently. Yeah. And like, you know, I think people just need to be like patient with themselves and not be so hard on themselves. But, you know, not, yeah, not everyone's going to do everything perfect from the beginning. And yeah. also I think another great thing is just to learn to live without convenience. And like, you know, if you can go, if you're like, forget your coffee mug and then you still want a coffee, like, can you live without that? Yeah. And then just remember it the next day. Yeah. Probably can. Well, yeah. cool. Thanks for popping on. Yeah. Appreciate chatting with you. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Totally. Let's get out of this rain. I know. Yeah, it's good <laughs> while it lasted. <laughs> <laughs>Well, thanks to each and every one of you for sitting in, being a fly on the wall during that little conversation with Diane. If you'd like to learn more about The Den, um, you can do so at thedenyaklulet.com. That's the, T-H-E, den, D-E-N, yaklulet. This is a tricky one. U-C-L-U-E. L-E-T.com, the denyaklulet.com. Um, they ship all across Canada. I believe they do the United States as well. And if you're ever in Yaklulet, I 10 out of 10 recommend checking out the spot. They have some really great, cool products in there. Great, lovely folks. Um, and wherever you are in the world, I highly recommend just popping onto Google and searching for a refillery near you, somewhere where you can support local, um, do more local, buy good products that aren't going to destroy the environment and can keep you healthier and ultimately happier. So if you've enjoyed this podcast, you can do me a solid by liking it, sharing it, rating it up on whatever platform you've listened to it on or watched it on. And if you're enjoying all the videos that I make that you can see all over Instagram, YouTube, um, TikTok, at Nerdy About Nature, um, you know, this whole thing is a passion project that I started to just kind of share more about the natural world around us to get people stoked on it so we can all, you know, work together to create a more just, equitable, diverse, inclusive, and sustainable future for literally all of us. And none of this is possible without support from folks like you, folks who are enjoying the work that I'm that I'm making here. So um, if you're not a supporter already, I would really appreciate it if you took a moment to check out nerdyaboutnature.com or um, support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash nerdyaboutnature. You know, you can join for as little as $1 a month or maybe bump it up to five if you feel like buying me one coffee a month, maybe 15 if you want to buy me lunch or something or take it even higher and, you know, get me dinner from time to time. Whatever it is, I appreciate any and everything. Um, you know, again, without you, none of this would be possible. So that just about wraps up today's episode. I'm going to take off from the side of the parking lot here um, and I hope to catch you out here in a, in a couple weeks weeks where I have some new content coming out, some new nerdy stuff, got some great guests lined up. You're going to be so, so stoked on it. Some really high quality nerdy content coming your way. And um, yeah, I'll catch you all soon. Take care.